Hey guys, this is Andrea. Welcome back to the channel. So guys, this is a follow-up to a video I did of how to not out someone with a hidden disability and why someone might choose not to disclose their disability. And I just wanted to follow up on a few things because while I was editing, I realised uh, there was a few things I didn't mention. Um, there is a lot of parallel to LGBTQ culture here as well so um for ease of access i will say queer culture in australia that is reclaimed language guys side note but so a lot of people will choose not to disclose their disability because one internalized ableism i do also over on the blog it's coming have a thing of what is ableism two it might not affect their life in a way that it needs to be disclosed to people. Um, three, it might not be relevant to the situation. Um, it also might put them at serious risk. And this is what I want to touch on, guys, going back through those, is that it's unless that person chooses to disclose it's really none of our business um type of thing that you can offer all the accommodations in the world but one way to not single people out is offer them across the board so if someone needs to leave early whether that be because they've got kids to pick up from school or take them places offer remote working offer if that's possible for your industry. I know there's some industries, customer service and stuff, that you can't. Have flexible workouts. Um, have options for cashiers to sit down. If you're in sales, um, and like business sales, have work from home as an option. Um, there's actually been a lot of studies about work from home producing bigger productivity because you're not stuck with bigger, busy work as well um, and then the other thing is in a work and volunteering context is privacy if you disclose that someone's disability that's actually a really breach of big breach of their privacy and also on a personal level their trust so are they going to trust you with information again and guys this is where it has those links to queer culture as well that a person not it might be at risk to their job um, their housing situation or their family if they are not out of the covered closet um, so that one's a really interesting one to look at with the links of disability and queer culture and there is more and more research coming out about people who are neurodiverse so ADHD autism on the spectrum having gender dysphoria, having um, different sexualities as well, so being having same-sex attraction and stuff like that. And we don't talk about that in disability often um, as well. It's in the past been something that's been actively discouraged. Um, due to a lot of complex historical factors but this is where as i said before it's actually none no one's business unless you're providing support or allied health services to them you really don't need to know everything about their lives if you're romantically interested you do you but that's the thing they might mask for a reason if they're neurodiverse and masking does take a lot of emotional energy it is quite freeing when someone processes their internalized ableism to be able to realize that disability is not a dirty word and i know i was on a phone call this morning while i was working on a blog post guys there is some shadow hunters coming content coming um i've just done a revisit of magnus and trauma 
Um, there were some angles I hadn't explored. So look out for that. That drops soon. Um, but that's the thing that masking does is physically and emotionally taxing. Um, pr and masking being pretending to be neurotypical when you're neurodiverse. And neurotypical is a interesting word in a lot of people are starting to see it used as an insult. And I've done the blog post on words matter, but how words are used also matter. But that's a whole other video. So that's the thing that I'm starting to get a little bit more comfortable using these languages. But I don't want to go into using them as insults and weapons because we should all be in this together instead of against each other in fighting it just does not make sense guys to have that in fighting um, even within the disability culture because disability as we've seen particularly with the COVID and the pandemic it's something that it's a community that anyone can join at any time in their life. 80% of people aren't born with the disability, they acquire it and they realise the lack of accessibility, the lack of accommodations, that it's hard to live on a constant budget um, and that they start realising all of these links are systemic issues and this is real diversity and inclusion because we're starting to see a pushback of diversity and inclusion and that act actively harms disabled people. Um, and that active harm when it's a very traditionally marginalised group that have been spoken for and to instead of lifted up and celebrated for what they can and can't do, it's been a source of shame and embarrassment for a lot of people. Um, we need to get to a place as a society where people with disabilities are accommodated and not only accommodated, they are celebrated, not for who they are, because, but for what they've achieved. So moving beyond the inspiration porn to celebrating their achievements. Um, great historical example, Helen Keller, but then in Australia, we have someone who was a champion to the disabled through polio, um, Sister Kenny, hoping to do a blog post on her, but that's going to require a bit of travel, guys. So, but that's where not outing someone and respecting their privacies and their boundaries is so important to understand that they have a right to privacy, a right for their information to be their information, for them to choose when, where and if they even want to disclose it as well. So I've done a blog post on good and bad support and I've also mentioned about the support worker and support workers language that you don't want to unintentionally name that person but we have seen so many cases of people support workers sharing information and people being able to identify that person even though they're not using names or addresses or phone numbers because of the location that we live guys so that's a really interesting one to have a look at as a support worker or support organization as we transition from the medical model into the social model of disability a lot of providers I found through lived experience are really struggling with this but coming up to Christmas and we do have a bit more COVID outbreaks as well um, we don't in Australia we don't have mandatory isolation at the moment but they do request people isolate um, that's the thing by not having the mandatory isolation and stuff we understand that people have freedom of movement freedom of accessibility but it's those people who don't respect the mask mandates don't respect the isolation 
there has been a pushback from the disability community because that's an example of unintentional ableism because people with a disability or chronic illness are twice as likely to die from COVID and it's not just another flu and as we see the progress and, and stuff like that we're seeing people become aware of what it's like to live the disabled lifestyle so I'm talking about living on the pension having a constant budget being restricted in your movement um, guys I am also going to do a video and blog post on restriction of movement that will be coming next year as well but I hope you guys enjoyed this one and the follow-up I'm enjoying creating them guys and please like share and subscribe and drop in the comments um, what would you how has your information been handled or mishandled and how have you and your family and caregivers friends handled that situation because it can be quite a confronting situation to be outed and that's where I've started to see the links to the queer community because um, unfortunately I live in a community that is very very conservative in that it has the highest amount of churches there is a queer community but they're very quiet about it as well we don't have any pride parades or things like that um, our major festival and tourist draw card is something that's been going since the second world war and then other festivals around Easter have come along that have been organised by churches. They were great for the economy, but just putting them out there for a bit of context of where I live. Guys, so please like, share and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.